Welcome to the Ideas on Stage podcast, your regular insight into leadership communication. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here. And Rachel, I, I, need, to, I need to tell you something. In preparation for these conversations, I like to do my homework. And in your case... You, on the one hand, you made it super, super easy because I looked at your blog and I've never seen something like this. I think you have more than 100 pages, lots of articles, and it was fantastic because I could really go deep and, and, and be prepared for this conversation. On the other hand, you also made it very difficult because I couldn't stop. Like there were so many articles <laughs> and each, each article led to another one. And it was, I, I had to force myself to stop at some point. Otherwise, it would be too many hours of preparation. There's 1,600 blogs there. So yeah, a lot, lot to get your teeth into. But thank you for checking it out. 1,600 blogs. Yeah. Wow, that's that's effective communication. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I hope so. So with you, we will be talking about all things internal communication. And, and let's get started with the basics. Why, why internal communication? Why do we need to care about it? Why is this important? Internal communication is very often a function that people don't realize exists. Um, but more often than not, we've all been exposed to it at some point in our working careers so the wonderful thing about internal comms is the purpose of it isn't telling people what to do it's to create a shared understanding and a shared meaning inside an organization and the reason that's important is because then your employees can align their efforts to your purpose to your goals your objectives as an organization so it helps an organization make sense of itself and it's a real privilege to work in internal comms. You get to see under the hood inside organizations and really discover what makes them tick. And you said something now that it's not about telling the audience what to do. And you made me think of something that I read on one of your articles, which was great. And I agree with it 100%. There was a question somewhere, and I think you were asking the reader to ask themselves this question. And the question was, what do you want your audience to do or to say or to feel or to believe as a result of your communication? And I like that because, for example, what we do, Rachel, at Ideas on Stage is all things presentation skills. And in a presentation, one of the mistakes I see is that we think that our objective is just to inform the audience. Whereas I think that when it comes to giving a presentation, and I think you tell me, but in communication in general, the objective when we communicate an idea should not be just to inform the audience. Because if that's the case, we can give them a document, we can mm. make a phone call. When we communicate an idea, we need to go beyond just sharing some information. And so that question that you asked your reader resonated with me. Would you like to, to share your, your, your thoughts and your ideas around this idea of being clear about what we want our audience to do, to believe, to feel as a result of our communication? I'm really glad that you read that. That's super important to me. So that's my intentions framework. And that's all the questions that I ask myself and I encourage my clients to think about. So before you dive into doing a campaign or a story or a presentation, it's having real clarity in terms of what do I want people to do, say, think, feel. I sometimes I add the word differently as a result of that communication and how do I want or need them to behave. And the reason that's critical is because if I don't set those intentions, then I can't measure I can't have real clarity in terms of, did I achieve that objective? And there's a beautiful quote from a journalist, Sidney Harris from the 1940s. And he talked about information is giving out and communication is getting through. So it's exactly what you said. It's not about standing up and performing and informing someone. It has to go deeper. You have to check for understanding. You have to check that things are resonating because then if, if things become tangible, people will take action. So the whole wonderful world of internal communication is not just about broadcast and pushing out one way monologue. It's all about dialogue. It's all about two way conversations. That's the beautiful vibrancy of good, effective internal communication for me. It's understanding whether things have resonated, 
are people taking action as a result of something that you've made them do, say, think or feel? And then how can you measure that? How can you quantify it? So it's not a dark art. It's not, you know, a fluffy, nice to have. It's business critical and it should be robust and approached with that sort of rigor. It is business critical and it's very much connected to, to the approach we follow. So for example, Rachel, when we create a presentation together with a client, one of the very first questions is always, okay, what do you want your audience to do as a result of that presentation? And then once this is clear, then we can start thinking about, okay, what, what feelings do we need to generate as a result of, your, of our presentation? so that they do what you want them to do? What do they need to believe so that they take action? As you said, what do they need to know so that they have these beliefs and these feelings so that they take action? So absolutely, it is business critical. And in, in business, uh, Rachel, let's also talk about some of the, um, in your experience, you've been working with, with a lot of clients over the, over, the, over the years. What are some of the either challenges or, or pressures that, particularly internal communicators face? There are so many. <laughs> we could spend the whole rest of our time together listing them out. I think the key bit for me is the, one of the most important roles of internal communication is making sure that our employees have the right information at the right time to help them do their jobs. And then layered into that is making sure that you're listening as well. So you're amplifying the voices of employees, you're sharing stories. I talked about the importance of creating a shared understanding and a shared meaning. One of the key challenges for internal communicators is how do you help the organisation make sense for its people? So you're drawing out stories, you're using peer to peer content because it's more credible, it's more trusted, it's more reliable, it's often more accurate than leadership communication. And we spend a lot of time trying to encourage our leaders and our people managers to be brilliant communicators. You cannot be a brilliant leader without being a brilliant communicator. So we spend a lot of energy focused on how do we coach and train the people who are client facing or you know, employee facing inside an organisation to set them up for success so they can go and be everything they need to be inside the organisation. And these leads me to... Another question I wanted to ask you, I said now that you also talk about why leaders need to be excellent communicators. And I found on your website that one of the, the talks, the presentations that you often give is exactly that. Why, if I remember well, why something along the lines of why leaders need to be excellent communicators. So of course you can't give us that talk now, but what's what's the gist of it? What what are the key reasons why they need to, leaders need to be excellent communicators? Why does this matter to them? It matters so much. It particularly matters during change communication. So imagine an organization is going through a tough time. Maybe there's a merger and acquisition or maybe there's redundancies and restructures. You rely as an organization, as a, as a comms team, you rely on your leaders to help it make sense for your people. So if you are relying on line managers and leaders to tell the story of the change, to communicate with compassion and empathy, to share difficult messaging for employees to help them understand that they might be losing their jobs or there's a restructure. If that's a really poor experience for your people, then the experience that they have is, is not great. So the key role for internal communicators is to equip and empower and enable our leaders to be brilliant at what they do. And if you're communicating a difficult message, nothing takes away from the fact it's a difficult message, but you can do so with humanity and with compassion and really make sure that you're listening as a leader to capture people's questions, to pick up rumours and sentiment, feeding that back into a comms team. So you readjust messaging and you make sure you're actively listening. So if you don't have that in place and you are making big changes at a global scale and you're hoping that there's a cascade that's going to happen and it falls down at that level because you haven't coached your leaders, you haven't trained them effectively, then it's just a really poor experience all around. So your brand suffers, your reputation suffers, productivity suffers, everything suffers. This is why it's business critical. So the opposite should also be true. If you are enabling your leaders to understand that that's part and parcel of their role, it's critical that to 
most leaders are, are promoted because they're subject matter experts in their technical field, not necessarily because they're great people managers or great communicators. So there's a real responsibility on organisations to make sure that we are equipping people when they get promoted or moved into managerial roles, that they understand this is what we expect of you. Meet with your people, communicate with them, have team meetings. And this is what you can expect from us. We will give you advice and guidance, toolkits, templates, training, whatever that looks like, because that experience has to be a really good one all around. And you mentioned a couple of things, Rachel, that I'd like to discuss in a little bit more detail. One is communicating change. And another one, which I love, you use the word empathy, communicating with empathy, which is so important. Uh, one by one. So first of all, so let's talk about communicating change and then we can go back to empathy later. But do you have any practical tips or suggestions, do's and don'ts, any best practices when it comes to communicating change? Any examples, anything at all that comes to mind? Sure. So in my experience, most change is perceived as loss. So when employees hear change is coming, they immediately go into a negative mindset and think there's going to be restructures or redundancies. And it could be something really positive. It could be positive change. We don't help ourselves in organisations because regardless of what the change is, whether it's a merger, acquisition, new CEO, new product, new service, they're all called change. So very often it's the language that trips us up. So the, the more you can define and articulate change clearly and articulate it in a way that's compelling and understood, the better the change initiative or campaign or programme will be. So where you see organisations making grand sweeping statements about transformation, if you don't check for understanding, you know, talking about earlier about information's giving out, communications getting through, if you're giving out a word like transformation, but you don't check for understanding right at the very start of your change communication campaign, and right at the end, you check six months, 12 months down the line. If you find out then that that word didn't make sense, it's a bit too late. So for me, iterating and evolving and measuring as you go is critical for change communication. And in terms of practical things that I like to do, normally change is messy and it's chaotic and rarely do we get brought in in a very timely manner as professional communicators. We normally get brought in when conversations have happened already and everything's been decided. And then our job is to help communicate this with our employees. And the key bit there for me is I'm not communicating to employees, but for them and with them. So I like to map out my known knowns and my known unknowns, because more often than not, when you're brought in to change communication, and particularly for me as a consultant, when I'm brought in, there's a lot of mess and there's a lot of noise going on. So I like to write it down, grab a notebook, split it down the middle, my known knowns, exactly what's happening. This is happening. This is when, this is who, who's impacted. And then my known unknowns might be the detail. And that's what our employees need to know exactly when, exactly who, exactly how, what do I need to be concerned about? What do I need to worry about? So on a real practical level, if you know that change is coming, mapping out those known knowns and known unknowns helps me get organized. And then over time, I'm trying to move everything into my known knowns. I'm trying to get real clarity because then I've got a good source of truth that I can communicate from. And it's just keeping people accountable. Have we decided this? Have we decided that? So that's a super practical thing that I do, regardless of how big the change is, big or small, I want to get organized and map out what is it that we know, what are we certain of, and what's still to be decided. The known knowns and the known unknowns. I like it. Yeah. And, and you also said that sometimes you are, as a consultant, you are called and is perhaps even too late, or it could be just not, not as early as you want it to be in the process. And when that happens, sometimes... And, and I guess you have experience with this, what was maybe a small change becomes or has, or has become a very big change. And that change could also become a, even a crisis. Sometimes an internal, it could be an internal crisis. It could be a crisis that also has external implications. So when it comes to communicating a crisis or within a, a crisis, again, do you have any suggestions or or do's or don'ts, any, any tips, any best practices to consider? 
So I'm an ex-journalist. I started my career as a journalist for four years before I discovered the wonderful world of internal communication. And I think one thing that journalists are really good at, and there's lots of us working in internal comms who are ex-journalists, is we like to get to the heart of the story. We like to get the facts and we like to be accurate. And that's a really fantastic mindset to be in, particularly in a crisis, because you need to have source of truth. You need to have facts. And very often in a crisis, as in change communication, when there's rumours, when there's all sorts of noise going on inside an organisation, it's really hard for employees to make good decisions based on fact. So what I try to do in a crisis is try to, again, map out your known knowns and your known unknowns, because you need a single source of truth. Some organisations, that's their intranet, their internal website. Some organisations, that's their leaders, their people managers. It's really important that when I go into organisations, I want to understand who do people know, like and trust? Who are the credible, accurate, reliable communicators inside the organisation who people trust and they go to to help steer through whatever the crisis may be? The last you know, couple of years in particular, we've faced so many crises on it feels like a weekly basis with all sorts of things being thrown our way as professional communicators navigating through the pandemic suddenly you have to be subject matter expert in furlough, for example, which I'd never heard of. And then I ended up writing blog posts on it to try and encourage the, my, my comms friends and network and community to help us navigate through this. So I think one of the biggest attributes to have as an internal communicator is curiosity in terms of getting to the truth, creating facts. So then you can go from a place of consistency for your organization. In your experience, Rachel, do, are facts enough when it comes to communicating whatever it is that an organization needs to communicate? No, I think they're a great starting point, but I think that the beauty for internal comms is when you bring it to life. So we mentioned empathy earlier. If you can have facts, which are, you know, unfortunately people are going to be losing their jobs, for example, you need to create a compelling story and a compelling narrative. So we call that the strategic narrative in the world of internal comms. So you're telling the story of the organization, where it's come from and where it's going. It's full of facts, it's full of figures, but that's not what we remember. We remember stories. So a key part of the role of an internal communicator is how do you craft a meaningful story from the data that you have, and from the insights that you have, whatever the situation may be, change, crisis, whatever it might be. It's how can you use the facts to guide your people along that. We talk a lot about change journey in the world of internal comms. We're helping them navigate through the change curve. So we're out the other side where people understand what's going on. I use three C's a lot in my work. I use consistency, clarity, and certainty. And whatever campaign I'm doing, particularly change, I'm looking for consistency. I'm looking for clarity and I'm looking for certainty because that's what our people are looking for. Yeah. And you you mentioned the word empathy a few times. So so let's talk about it. In addition to to what you said, is there anything else that you'd like to share when it comes to communicating with empathy? And the reason why I'm asking again is because I think that this is one of the most important things in, in communication. Like in our world, for example, Rachel, for us, it's all about present, present, presentations, presentation skills, public speaking. And often one of the mistakes in that world is that we assume that when we give a presentation, it's our presentation. Whereas I think that it's always their presentation. It's always the audience's presentation. And this is a mindset that creates empathy when you communicate because it's for them. You said before, I think you said, we communicate not to employees, but for employees, not to people, but for people, which is very much connected. Do you have anything else to add when it comes to communicating with empathy? So I think empathy is an absolute superpower for internal communication. If you really understand and harness the power of empathy, it can help things to make sense inside an organization if you have leaders who are empathetic is absolute superpower because when you are communicating difficult news in particular and we've done a lot of it over the past couple of years displaying empathy for people who were juggling caring responsibilities for example homeschooling the you, there were stories online constantly where employees were frustrated and felt under pressure you know working from home and and perhaps having homeschooling as well the organizations that did really badly 
made the headlines. The organisations who didn't act with empathy, but just expected more and more and more from employees where they were stressed and they were, you know, dealing with mental health issues, all sorts of things that have been going on the past couple of years. The organisations who do that well are the ones who display empathy and support the well-being and mental health of their employees, who you don't need to know all the answers, but it's just using language like we get that this is hard. We don't know what's going on as well. We're trying as best as we can. There's a mindset called working out loud, which I really like. And it's around just sharing your thinking and iterating as you go. The best leaders for me are the ones who say, I haven't got this all sorted, particularly in a crisis situation, but they're demonstrating empathy and they're demonstrating trust that says, as soon as we figure this out, we'll let you know. Keep talking to me. I'm going to keep listening to you. Narratives like that are really compelling and really, really, that's what we warm to. Very often in the world of internal comms, we plan for the head. My advice to clients at the moment for 2022 and beyond is we need to plan for the hearts as well. It's not just about head and facts and figures. I use a beautiful quote from Maya Angelou a lot in my work is that people will forget what you did. They'll forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that feeling for internal communication, if you're wrapping up empathy in that, is absolutely the way forward. It's behind me, I've got an artwork, which is what happens inside is reflected outside. And that's the ethos of the work that I do. When you're in an organisation and you're feeling really, really stressed and there's a really toxic culture, that will seep out. If you're in an organisation where it's positive, that will also seep out too. And the same is true for internal communicators who are in super, super visible roles, that what's going on for us in terms of mental health and well-being, everyone can see it. Everyone can judge what we write and judge what we say. So for me, that nurturing, empathetic way of working is the only way to be. Do you have any, by any chance, any examples of, they don't have to be your own clients, they could be if you want, but any examples of companies who are communicating with empathy, if that's something that you can see externally, any, any, anything at all, that, any examples? I've seen bits, I've seen bits and bobs. There's not one client, one client or company that I would say has got this completely nailed because this is quite a shift. It's quite the, not the opposite of how we've communicated to date, but it's quite, it takes courage to change the way that you're communicating, to create space for your employees to work out loud and to be able to say, we haven't got this all sorted, but we're open to ideas and, and working with you. So I would love to say there's a whole handful of people who I think are doing brilliantly, um, but there's not, in yeah. honesty, that there, there's just not. But it's the bad ones that make the headlines. Yeah. There's the bad ones that sell, sell the newspapers and get the clicks. So you said the approach is, is called working out loud. Yeah, working out loud. So there's a brilliant TED talk by a chap called John Stepper that he did in 2016, I think. There is a blog post <laughs> on my blog. There's always a blog post, as you've discovered. And it's hashtag WOL online. So there's some uh, principles of working out loud. There's five conditions for working out loud. And it's about leading with generosity. And it's about narrating your work so you're being very visible in what you're doing you're you're bringing people with you which is a great way to be and in his TED talk John talks about the origins of working out loud and where it came from and how it can really help organizations we've seen a real shift inside companies where you know you used to be rewarded for your knowledge and knowledge was power when you're at school you shield your thinking and you keep your work to yourself what we've seen over the past 10-15 years in organizations with the rise of things like enterprise social networks. So we have Workplace by Facebook or Meta as it is now, and Yammer and all sorts of different technologies that have been introduced to help people work out loud. So no longer do you have to have all the answers. You're being actively encouraged to post on these internal social media platforms to say, I'm thinking of doing X. Has anyone got an idea about it? Has anyone tried this before? That's the working out loud mindset. And that's a huge cultural shift for many organisations because that's typically not what we do. We promote people because knowledge is power. So that's been a huge cultural shift in many organisations over the last 10 to 15 years through the rise of internal social media, which is endlessly fascinating. There's lots of articles about that on my blog. 
because you mentioned social media now, Rachel, you also made me think of another of your talks that, that you have on your website. And, and perhaps it's not connected at all, but because you said social media, I started thinking about personal brand. And you also talk about the importance of personal brand, why we need to care about it, why we need to develop it. Could you tell us more about how you look at the idea of building a personal brand? Absolutely. So I define your personal brand as your reputation and promise. So it's who you are and what you're known for. And Jeff Bezos from Amazon talks about it as what people say about you when you're not in the room, which is really important to know. So people who work in internal communication are focused on branding. We're focused on reputation from an internal perspective. So personal branding is about knowing what you stand for, knowing your personal values. Therefore, for me, when I started researching personal branding back in 2017, it was because I kept seeing this phrase and I thought, I don't know what that is. I want to know more about it. As someone who is running a business, which at that point in time, it was just me. I wanted to know what am I known for? And what do clients know me for? And therefore, what is my reputation and promise? And how do I crystallize that? How do I articulate it? How do I make sure it aligns with my personal values? So I did a lot of work along those lines in terms of how can I make sure that there's congruence between what's important to me, what motivates me, what inspires me. So having real clarity in terms of my personal values, what makes me tick, enabled me to reframe and refocus my business to align perfectly with my values. So then I know if that's the work I'm offering, so training, mentoring, consultancy aligns perfectly with my values. So therefore you're going to get a great experience. I'm going to get a great experience. Clients are going to get a great experience. So having that real clear awareness of who I am, what I'm known for, what I want to be known for and how to bridge any gaps has transformed the way that I work and, and given me a tr truly greater understanding of the importance of my reputation and promise. Yeah. And just now, Rachel, you also talked about bridge, bridging gaps. And in your blog, you also talk about, and I, and I loved it, you talked about the importance of closing integrity gaps. Mm. And what you meant by that is that we need to be very careful because what we say and what we do, th there can be a gap between what we say and what we do. And I think that, that there shouldn't. And so th these are the integrity gaps you talk about. Uh, could you speak to that? Yeah, of course. I, I find this a lot in organisations with leaders. So if they say my door is always open, but it's a figure of speech and they're very closed and they're never around. And if they appear with their frontline employees, they're always dashing around and in meetings, their door's not actually always open. It's just a figure of speech. And therefore, there is integrity gap between what they're saying and what they're doing. And the first people to know that are your employees. They notice that, that integrity gap. So it breaks down trust and it breaks down credibility. And therefore, when a leader is perhaps trying to display empathy and trying to communicate something very difficult, if the trust is already broken, then it doesn't help them. So knowing what the integrity gaps are is super important and calling it out. And if you're not sure inside an organization, your employees will be able to tell you where they see one thing being said and one thing being done. And... Now, Rachel, let's talk about something else. And by the way, if it sounds like that I'm jumping from one topic to another, randomly, it's because I am. I'm, I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, totally... that's, that's communication. That's all good. <laughs> it's, it's because I have, I have a list of things that I wanted to explore with you. But then, of course, sure. depending on what you say, I, I do jump from one thing to another. No but, but hopefully it would be useful for listeners as well. So... When I think about communication, I think that maybe communication 50 years ago or more than that was a certain kind of communication. Today, communication is also international communication. And when it comes to communicating internationally, I would love to hear your thoughts because that, that has some implications. One is language. Like sometimes, and for example, I'm Italian, I live in the UK, and so I communicate often in a language which is not my first language, and, and that happens to many other people. Or you communicate to an audience in a language, 
and that language is not their first language. And it, it's not just language, it could be also that has implica cultural implications, cultural differences. So what are your thoughts? And again, this could be do's or don'ts, it could be suggestions, it could be principles to consider around international communication. So the joy of international communication is uh, there's so many layers to it and it's really easy to get it wrong. Um, and it's actually quite simple to put it right as well. So the key bit for me is listening. So if you have a feeling that communication isn't flowing in the right way inside your organization with your international markets, it could be any number of reasons. It could be language, as you've correctly said. It could be timing. So trying to do a global announcement inside a you know, multinational company um, it's inherently tricky because it will never be the right time for your whole market. If it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night in Mexico and it's whatever the, you know, whatever the timings are, there's really a perfect time to make a global announcement. So if you're a listed company, for example, you're trying to time announcements that could impact share prices, um, have to be when certain markets open. It could be brilliant for New York and it could be dreadful for Sydney. So international communication requires careful handling and careful effort. There's a model that I use that I created a number of years ago, which is global, local, me. So it's in a, in a table format where global communication is something that's applicable to everybody. And then local is, as the name implies, a much more local. So in this scenario, I would want to see a global announcement, for example, which is often generic. Then we need to work on the translation into local and then it goes down into me and there's arrows between global to local local to me so for international communication to work we need to be really cautious and mindful in terms of what's that translation from global to local local to me because our employees when they're listening to global communication they i flip the model around they go me local global but we don't plan like that we plan global local me so for international communication to resonate well we need to make sure that we've answered the question, what's in it for me? Does this information, you know, is it being shared in a language that makes sense, at a time that makes sense? Do I know who to ask questions to at a local level? And do they know where to get help from at a global level? So it's a really simple framework, but I use it constantly in my work because if we don't do that translation from global to local, local to me or vice versa, that's when communication breaks down because it might be in the wrong language, it might be at the wrong time, and it might be culturally insensitive if we haven't taken the richness and diversity of audiences into account or employee groups into account, then you can miss the mark really, really quickly. So that's really important to me and helping people focus and understand the more time, money and investment that you put into planning good, effective international communication, the more it will pay off. Yeah. You said, what's in it for me, which is super, super important in communication. One of the, so you, you shared your format, which is global, local, me, a format that we use in a different context uh, in a company. When we work with clients to help them simplify the message, a, a format that works really well is what, so what, what next? So we push our clients to create, to summarize the core idea behind the next presentation, following the what, what's the key thing the audience needs to take away from their presentation. And then what's in it for me is what we say, so what? Mm -hmm. Why should they care? Why is this relevant to the audience, to me, to that person, no, not to me as the presenter? And then what next, which goes back to the very first thing we discussed, what do you want your audience to do as a result of your presentation. Yeah, and also, Rachel, now, now you gave us a few examples of international global contexts, and, and it sounds like that when we think about in internal communication, I might be wrong, you tell me, but we immediately start thinking about multinational companies because that's when they need international communication. They need to get it right. But I think that we also need to think about startups and, and small, small companies because even in a two-person team, it could be a business owner and a, an assistant, for example. There is communication. And it, communication, even in that context, is super important. 
So if you think about smaller organizations, are there any either any differences or anything that they need to consider or anything that small organizations need to know when it comes to internal communication? So there's a blog post you'll be surprised to hear. <laughs> so I wrote a blog post on what startups need to know about internal communication because you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's really important as your company scales, as you have more people, therefore your culture scales and therefore your communication needs to scale too. So it's really important that you'll get to a point if you are growing a business, if you get to the point where you don't know who everybody is and you haven't got processes written down, then if you're analyzing the way that the organization is working, I guarantee one of the top three problems will be communication or lack of. And the reason for that is when you don't have consistency in place, where you don't have all employee meetings in place, whether you're a team of two or a team of 200, it's really important that you start to communicate really, really well. And the reason for that is that you're having sources of truth and you're helping your employees know where to go to get credible, accurate, reliable information, but also having an opportunity to challenge, to ask questions, to see leaders face to face and to help them understand what they're part of. That's back to that shared understanding and shared meaning I talked about right at the start. So it's super important. No organization is too big or too small to implement internal communication. When startups invest in internal communication, it's normally because they've got to a point where maybe they're scaling even more or they're getting funding or they're going for initial public offering, IPO, and then they suddenly need to have systems and processes in place for communication. So it's never too early to start investing in good, effective internal communication. And now, Rachel, as we approach the, the conclusion of our conversation, I've got, if we've got time, let's see, I've got a couple of questions, which are mainly for me. I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> and so, because you've got a couple of blog posts and one is about how to prove the value of internal communication or communication in general. So I'm just, I'm just curious, like, Again, from that perspective, maybe when, when you need to, when you speak to a potential client or a client and you need to, you find yourself in situations where you need to prove the value of internal or it could be communication in general. What are your thoughts around that? So I'll tell you the context behind that. that blog. I know the one you mean. So I wrote that blog post after having a mentoring conversation with a very senior uh, comms professional who was being asked to prove the value of his function um, ahead of cuts being made. And it, it incensed me, if I'm honest with you. And I felt really passionate about it and thought other people were being asked to do this to prove the value of internal communication, to prove the value of what we do. So I wrote that blog post. What I published is a much more toned down than the first version, which is very cathartic, let me tell you, just to get that out. Um, and then, you know, any good communicator reviews their work. <laughs> and I read, make sure it was appropriate and shared it. But it's a constant conversation and it's very frustrating. It is a constant conversation that internal communication is not a nice to have. It's a need to have. It is business critical. It's, it's a business function in that it enables a business to function. So the more that you invest in internal communication, and there's a difference for me between internal communication, which is the overarching way a company communicates, and internal communications, which are the tools, tactics, channels, and methodologies, you need to be focused on both because internal communication is too important to be left down to one team, one department, one person. It's everybody's responsibility. You know, we can't be there when a leader is having one-to-one -one conversations with their team, but through our, inter that's internal communication, but through our internal communications, we can probably give them a, a talking guide or a, a brief in terms of here's how to hold a really effective conversation with your team members. Here's how to display empathy, et cetera. So, when you're being asked to prove the value of internal communication, it's normally actually channels related. So intranets, publications, magazines, apps, whatever it might be. We are spoilt for choice when it comes to channels. So it's a, it's a, I get really passionate about it. You probably tell, I get really incensed. And I, I always, when I'm having these sort of conversations with clients, I get them to describe to me, what would it be like if you didn't exist? 
So if the function didn't exist, what would the outcome be? What would the impact be to the business? What would the productivity look like? What would the confusion look like? What would the rumours look like? How long would people spend searching for credible, accurate, reliable information to make informed decisions? And that's the lens to look through. It's not about having posters and apps and all of the channels. It's understanding the criticality of, of consistent, clear communication inside an organisation. Oh, I could talk all day on that. <laughs> no, that's, so, so you said, what would it be like if it didn't exist, right? So that's the yeah. question. Interesting. Yeah, and, and I can see how you can apply, you can ask the same question or for anything else. Like, what would it be like if internal communication didn't work well, for example? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. All right, perfect. And the other, the other article was, uh, and I'm part, I don't know whether the title was this, but just remember, and you wrote about how to say no to stakeholders and mm -hmm. again that could be saying saying no to a request for a meeting or it could be saying no to to any other any other request or activity and also personally i find it more and more useful more and more important to be able to say no at the right time do you have any any ideas, any any tips, suggestions, best practices? The reason I wrote that is because inherently, and I'm generalizing here, but it's true, internal communicators are nice people. We are people people, we're curious, we want to understand what makes an organization tick, and we want to understand what makes people tick. And we typically are yes people, where we want to do our best. We want to help an organization help itself. But through my experience, what that then means is that we take on a lot of things that actually we should push back and say no to. So we work really hard to develop good relationships with stakeholders inside an organisation. So we want to work to be trusted advisors. This is the pinnacle for internal comms people. We want to be trusted advisors inside our organisations. And therefore, when you're building relationships, it's tempting to say yes to things. But over time, you end up then locked into quite a tactical way of working, quite a reactive way of working, rather than being strategic, rather than giving yourself time to work on, not in the role that you're doing. So the more that you say no to the wrong things, the more it creates space for the right thing to come through. And from an internal comms perspective, it's helping stakeholders understand that we could write the stories for them. And we could write speeches for them, but actually the best thing to do is to train them to write authentically, to give them advice and guidance, particularly for those of us who are ex-journalists, where we can we can give you a, a guide, a one-page guide of how to write a great story and trust you to get on with it. There's a blog post on that called Wonky Comms, which is about trusting people. It's not going to be perfect and polished because people aren't seasoned writers, but that's the wonkiness. And that's the beauty of, of the vibrancy of good, effective internal comms. So you have to let go. So the more you take on and don't say no, and you don't equip other people to communicate, the less likely you can have a good impact in your organisation, the less likely you can get on with your work um, and you end up working tactically. So saying no is a really important lesson for everybody to learn to set boundaries inside yeah. your organisation. And there is a blog post for that. Uh, with you, it's like there is a saying, they say there is an app for that. And with you, <laughs> there is a blog post for that. <laughs> this is true. This but is, it what is 13, true. 13 years of blogging does for you. <laughs> it it, it is true. Post. Whatever, whatever. And this is for <laughs> listeners. Any, any question you may have around all things internal communication, I'm sure that there is a blog post from, from Rachel. Is it allthingsic.com that's right yeah all things and letter i letter c so internal communication all things all things ic.com check it out and is that if you think about internal communication beyond your own resources rachel are there any books or maybe one book in particular i love reading i love books uh, and a book that it doesn't have to be a book it could be something else but if you have a book even better that you would recommend if somebody if a business professional wants to go deeper and learn, learn more about internal communication yep so one of my i mean there's so many i've got in my, my office has got two bookshelves full of books 
Um, but my go-to is, is a book called Making the Connections by Bill Quirk, which is Q-U-I-R-K-E. And he published the first one in 2008 and the second one is 2009, I believe. So it's quite an old book, but it's the fundamental principles of good, effective internal communication are in there. And in Bill's book, he talked a lot about the roles that we do and how we come across. And it was my Bible. It was such an important, I was working in house when it came out and it was such a critical time for that book to be published for me because it helped me understand the theory and then I could translate it into reality. So making the connections by Bill Quirk, if you're new to the world of internal comms, that's a fantastic starting point. Great, thank you. Making the connections. Perfect. And if people would like to connect with you, Rachel, what, what should they do? Where, where do they find you? Come and find me on Twitter. I'm at all things I see on Twitter and I'm on Instagram, Rachel, all things I see. And I'm Rachel Miller on LinkedIn. Okay, fantastic. And is there anything else? Any final messages or ideas that you'd like to share with the listeners? Any requests, asks, anything? Maybe is there a question that you wanted me to ask you and I didn't do it? Anything else at all that you'd like to share with the audience today? I'd like to encourage people to, I've got my own podcast, the Candid Comms podcast. So if you're new to the world of internal communication, it's really practical and the conversations there and the ideas there are evergreen so they don't date so if you're stuck on something communication related if there's not a blog post there might be a podcast episode <laughs> to help you out <laughs> and and again to make sure that everybody got it the the name of the podcast is candid comms candid comms perfect all right rachel thank you very much i really thank enjoyed you. this conversation and i'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it too and found it useful and let's keep in touch and all the very best thank you so much if you enjoyed this episode of the ideas on stage podcast there are many more you might like so please subscribe leave us a review and tell us what you think you can find many more ideas on business communication at ideasonstage.com or by searching for Ideas on Stage on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and goodbye for now.